So I'm uh, Dr. Jonathan Roscoe from BT's Applied Research Labs. I'm a principal researcher and the paper I'm going to be presenting is a piece of work I did with my colleague Max Smith Creasy and it's about how we can use uh, acoustic emanation of haptics as a side channel for eavesdropping on gesture typing. So to start um, I want to talk a bit about side channel attacks and um, you know what are they and side channels are properties of a system um, that are present not because of the way the system was designed but because of the way it was implemented so these are uh, channels that can be uh, exploited inadvertently to achieve various ends uh, eavesdropping secret finding is, is a common one and, and then numerous examples of these um, have gone back a, a long long way electromagnetic radiation is a very popular one being able to recover video signals that are being sent to a monitor by um, inspecting a cable being able to look at a microchip and the heat that's coming off in different locations to determine which sections of the microchip are being used and what type of code is being run um, and all sorts of things like that. We're going to be focusing on timing and acoustic emanation. So the amount of time it takes to do something and the noise that's produced when you do it. Now, there's been a fairly long history of uh, acoustic emanations for eavesdropping. Uh, since about the 1950s, um, there, there's evidence of it being used, traditionally focusing on traditional keyboards, where the distinctive click-clack of a typing um, can result in something that, that's quite identifiable. This may be because of the particular distance of a key from a microphone. It may be because of distinct sounds that certain keys produce. Maybe they've been programmed that way. Often they haven't. Um, and there, there are a number of ways that these can be taken advantage of to determine what a user is typing in without having to hack the target system itself, purely by listening to the sounds of the user interacting with the device. Um, there's examples of this be also being used with uh, inkjet printers and being able to reproduce things that are being printed purely by listening to the sound that they produce. Um, we've also seen similar um, application of this to soft keyboards. We've not yet seen it to gesture typing. Uh, the closest example we could find is this paper on the right. Don't interrupt me while I type. This looks at software interrupts that are being produced by the keyboard. So when the user starts to type, there's a software interrupt. And if you monitor the timing between these interrupts, you can rebuild sentences. And what we've done is, is applied a similar concept to the acoustic information that comes from haptic feedback. For those who aren't aware, gesture typing or swipe keyboards are a fairly new but very common um, uh, type of, of keyboard input for mobile devices. Uh, Android phones have them, iPhones have them, there are native applications as, as well as many um, other additions that you can get from the store and they're present on other devices too. Um, if you've ever used it, it's quite simple. If you want to type the word well, for example, you swipe your finger through the letters. Rather than pressing each letter you're interested in, you simply swipe W-E-L-L. -L. Um, and then AI is used to, to determine what sentence it, it is that you meant to type. Now, a feature of these and the way they're implemented is that often there is um, a sound and a vibration that accompanies pressing down and starting a word. So what you should be able to hear now is the audio of a, a mobile device that's vibrating as someone is using the swipe and gesture keyboard. So that's what interests us. The, the question that we want to ask is, is this a viable way of eavesdropping? and recovering the input by a user. Now, to look at the actual feasibility of it, because we know it's, it's, it's not a very, if you've ever used a swipe keyboard, it's not necessarily an obvious sound. If you're in a, a busy room or walking about, you probably won't notice it. You probably have to be sort of dead of night, um, being uh, quite quiet to actually notice that vibration. Um, but there's plenty of evidence that the um, espionage involving uh, recovering audio um, has been carried out for decades. Um, so, for example, the, the great seal bug, which was hidden in a U.S. ambassador's office um, for years before British intelligence un un inadvertently found it. It's a very simple device. Um, so the opportunity is definitely there and so is the will to conduct this sort of espionage and spying. More so now where we're actively inviting these devices into our house. Um, lots of people have uh, Google and, and Alexa and Siri, um, as well as all sorts of other things they may not necessarily think about. So for example, this paper on the right, hard drive of hearing, um, is about using uh, hard drive platters to um, create artificial microphones, uh, synthesizer microphones. And this can be done effectively enough that you can then use Shazam 
to recognize music. And if you can do that, then it would be quite easy to place a bug in an office environment or, or some other room where you could monitor someone's conversations and typing on their phone and their device. So we wanted to actually prove if, given that there's, there's definitely opportunity for it, is it possible? So we uh, devised this setup um, where we have uh, on the left hand side a, a malicious attacker um, and a, an innocent hoodie wearing victim on the right. And we had two devices, a malicious device, which was a regular Android phone running a standard uh, audio recording application, and a target device, again, a regular Android phone running a simple notepad application. And we had the victim enter a number of sentences um, so that we could record that audio and build a database of sentences and, and try and classify them. Um, one thing worth noting is that the surface used um, so in this case, the phones were placed on a table. That did make it easier for us. Um, the, there's a, a, the, the propagation of sound through different surfaces has been studied and there are various ways this can do, this can be done. Um, but we, we figured that was a fairly common scenario that you would have someone typing like that. Um, but we think this can be used elsewhere as well. Um, so creating sound when the, the device, or gathering sound when the device is actually held in someone's hand. So um, if we look at some of the sounds that are produced, I'll play more of these uh, annoying uh, sounds again. Um, I should say that the phone we chose, so this is a Moto 5G, partly because it was particularly loud in its vibrations. Um, so if you try and, and follow along, um, here's the waveform um, that you can see, and I'll play the sound now. So the quick brown fox ran over the lazy dog. Um, you can see that some words obviously take longer than others to type. Um, and this is how we think that, that certain features, certain words can become recognizable because of the time they, they, they take to write. If we compare this to the pin for my card is one, two, three, four, um, it's slightly different. There are some similarities. But if you hear that, that last bit, that one, two, three, four is very rapid because it's not swiping through a word. It's going one, two, three, four, four quick, distinct presses with the keys right next to each other. And if we look at the actual, if you look at the actual swiping that's done uh, when you type different words, you can see how different words can have very different timings. Um, so the, for example, is nice, short, it's three characters, they're all fairly close together. The brown, um, only five characters, so not, not that much longer, but still there's a lot more travel over the keyboard. Um, this means that the word takes longer. So to do classification of this data, um, we, we carried out our experiment in our, our office environment, uh, gathering um, these audio recordings, building up that database of 10 sentences. Um, from in this pilot study, uh, just two users. Um, we then used um, dynamic time warping. So what we can do when comparing signals is we can use a, a traditional approach of comparing each point from signal A to um, signal to the corresponding point on signal B um, and doing a, a simple utility and distance. Um, the thing is that will often result in very poor matches because events, uh, time series signals may not line up perfectly. So dynamic time warping is something that we know works very well with time series data and allows you to, to compare to similar but not identical si uh, signals um, quite effectively. And what happens is you take one signal and you compare um, each point on that signal to the corresponding point on another signal. And when you do that, you generate a cost for every single point and, and, and the distance between two signals, allowing you to quickly and easily compare. So two perfectly identical signals will have a linear line straight upwards, whereas two different signals will be much more curvy um, with a higher cost. Um, so we can see here two, two different samples of the same sentence. So this is the same sentence being typed either by the same person at a different time or by two different people at different times, um, compared to uh, two different sentences by, at two different times or by two different people. Um, so we, we figured this was a, a good way to test the theory and, and compare it to time series data. I should say that the audio that we're using at this point is, or, or that, that, that we're operating on, is, is still um, fairly high quality audio data. Um, one thing we do need to do in our further work is actually just isolate the peaks uh, and, and reduce the complexity of these signals. 
in terms of the results, so we did achieve 70% classification of this data set. Um, we did see, um, as we included more samples, so we, we took um, 10 samples of, of 10 sentences by two people. So as we increased that, we saw a quite linear increase in the amount of time that this consumed, but we did see a modest improvement going from 40 to 70% accuracy. So we're quite pleased and we think this demonstrates the, the viability of the attack. In terms of the sentences we used, um, we tried to vary them. Uh, we wanted some of the long words, some of the short words, um, but all a fairly similar length for this, this study. Um, and you can see that the ones with more complex, longer words tend to be the ones that, that get classified the best. So um, computer security conferences are the best, for example, uh, achieve the, the best accuracy score. And we think that's because the, it consists of a number of long words, there's long distinctive periods where the finger is not being raised and new haptics aren't being triggered. Now, in terms of the countermeasures, um, there are opportunities to modify the haptic, um, but there is a trade-off between what's useful and what's secure. So what you could do that would be useful would be to increase the number of haptics, um, so include zero speed events. Um, that would be feedback when you were paused, for example, um, on a, over a particular uh, character, or when you turn and move the direction of your finger. Uh, unfortunately, that would give more data for classification, so that would be less secure. Um, you could have periodic haptics. So rather than having haptics that feedback in response to a specific event, you pressing or touching the screen for the first time, as, as normally happens, you do a simple haptic every half second that, that your finger is on the screen, for example. That lets the user know that they're interacting with the device, but doesn't quite correspond to what they're doing. Um, then we can get more secure, have chaff, for example. So introducing uh, entirely spurious haptic feedback um, that generates noise and, and prevents you from discerning what's real um, from what, what's completely fake. Um, great to secure it, but not so useful to the user because they, they, won't, they won't necessarily correspond to when they're touching. They may think their phone's been you know, pocket dialed. Um, disabling all haptics would be more secure, um, but doesn't give you that useful feedback because haptics are useful. Um, so there's some trade-off there that, that needs to be considered. There are other ways around it. So we could look at improved hardware. So not all phones produce such a loud um, noise in response to vibration, although there are better microphones and other equipment and other ways that you may be able to pick up that. Uh, one of the things we're running is could you um, use the accelerometer in a Fitbit or something to identify the haptic feedback um, and then reconstruct sentences through that without using the audio. So better motors might help with that. Uh, similarly, uh, solid state electrosensory mechanisms that don't have vibrating movie parts that will produce no noise. Um, there's also active noise cancelling. So there's this patent by Apple that, that seems to apply active noise cancelling to physical keyboards to mitigate the ability to, to discern sound from, from keyboards that are being used uh, in a laptop in this case. In terms of future work, so we want to look at improving practicality. Uh, we want to do more work over distance, so particularly nowadays, the distance at which uh, you know, we had two people in a closed room on a desk just a couple of meters apart um, you know, isn't something that we've seen a lot of recently. Um, so we want to experiment with different distances. Can we use things like laser microphones to detect um, haptics from another building, for example? Um, there's better recording equipment we could do. There are things we could do around um, denoising the environment and signal isolation. Also, we want to recognize smaller sentences and phrase identification. Um, so rather than having to recognize full sentences, um, we want to use other techniques. We've seen the use of neural networks um, and software interrupts in other papers. Um, so we think given that the, clearly there's the ability to, to recognize these different uh, samples, we could apply this to uh, fragment identification and that would provide a much more powerful ability to, to recognize text, particularly where there's uh, unseen sentences that contain common words and, and, and known phrases. Um, as well as that, there's author identification. We, we do want to expand the data set. We recognize this as a small data set with this pilot study. Um, obviously, recent events have made it difficult to get in a room uh, and actually record audio in, in close proximity like that. Um, we know also that the DTW is probably not the best way to go. Um, it's something that we know works well with time series data and we thought we'd prove the concept. So there are other things that we want to try around that. 
larger data sizes, as I say, we, is something we definitely need to do. Um, and also different environmental noise, noise profiles. So we tried this in a, in a quiet office environment, um, but you know, will it work on a train? Will it work in a street, in a cafe, that sort of thing? Um, and how well does it work? So we'd like to evaluate and compare that. So I'll, uh, I'll end it there. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, and if you've got any questions, either ask them now or please get in touch with either of us, both of us uh, via email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, congratulations for the, for the work. Uh, we have some questions here, so I will read for you, okay? So the security concerns uniform across most mobile phones or handsets? Um, so we, we only tested with Android phones because that's what we use in the lab. Um, but yes, we, we didn't, essentially we, we believe this will work with any. Uh, some handsets are better than others, um, but then, you know, a better microphone uh, or, or the use of something like an accelerometer may get around that. Um, at the, you know, the, there's been, uh, you know, slight twitches in hand movements are detectable, for example. Um, and we see, and we, we think that could be applied. So it may not necessarily be audio. Um, so yes, we, we think um, any handset could be susceptible to this. Yeah, we have another question is about your experience. What is your data points or your sample size? And uh, will future works take note of public data sets? If, taking, if you are going to consider public data sets? Um, we haven't seen any public data sets um, with this sort of recording. Uh, it seems to be quite niche. Um, in terms of the data set size, so we, um, we did consider because of the, so we were going to expand this to hopefully have at least 100 participants with, with a much greater uh, number of sentences. Um, but I think one of the, uh, well, we, we've had issues because of, of COVID, but we did consider developing an app that, that people mm. could download and it would synthetically generate the data, which we thought would be good. Not many people are keen on installing a, an eavesdropping app, even if they trust us, um, understandably. Um, so at the minute, the, the current sample size, we had two subjects with 10 sentences. Each sentence was captured 10 times. Um, so okay. that's a total of 200 recordings. Um, yeah, so, so we, we did try uh, uh, with just a handful, so, so uh, two samples, four samples, uh, right up until 19 samples. Obviously, when you add the author's um, own data set in, so not the exact same recording, but the same person typing the same sentence, it does get much better, um, but yeah. it does work cross-author too. Have you thought if you could make this, uh, your data set available for others? Even if it's small, maybe you can put it available for others and then you can update the, the data. Yeah, I think it's definitely something we'd it's, be interested in be doing good. and need to, yeah. need to look at that. If there's, if there's an appetite for it, I think it would be useful. Okay, we have more, more questions. Here we have time, so I'll do all the questions here. Uh, have you compared your, your work with others of, from the literature? And if not, is this uh, future work? Yeah, so the, I mean, the, 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 the main comparison for us has been the Don't Interrupt Me paper. That, that's a really good paper. Um, they have a bigger data set. They, that's entirely software based. It doesn't involve the hardware, the, the audio aspect. Um, so that's based on the software interrupts. I think that's a very good comparison for us. Um, we haven't done a direct comparison because we don't have the same quality of data set. We've not used the same methods in this approach, yeah. but um, I think definitely that that's a good one for us to, to compare ourselves to. Uh, and hopefully there will be others in time as well. Um, and they've had very promising results that I think, um, you know, hope, hopefully we, we can stand up next against. Yeah, we have one, uh, the guy is asking about the data, if it's public, you, you have uh, answered, but uh, he's also asking, asking if he, for this experiment, if the records was, uh, you have filtered the background noise. Um, we, we did do a bit of filtering, um, but we, we, it was inconclusive in terms of the benefits. Mm. Um, we, we didn't get around to exploring exactly why, um, but we did, we did experiment. There were some things, but in the end, we, we actually, for the uh, performance benefits we saw in the small trials, it, it added more time than it did to, to ignore it. So we, because we weren't seeing uh, an improved accuracy um, consistently. Um, I think that's something we need to do more of. 
Um, also, what we're interested in doing is actually just doing peak detection and focusing on the peaks um, rather than the entire audio signals. Because there's a lot of background, it's very minute background noise that's picked up. Yeah. Um, and obviously that increases the amount of time that DTW takes to run. Okay, so we have the last one. It's about the, is there any kind of concerns with your work? Um, I think obviously people would be very nervous. <laughs> obviously our, our, our intention is to identify threats so that we can yeah. uh, come up with the countermeasures and, and that's where our interest lies and, and you need to understand the threats. That's one of the reasons why the study is so limited is because it, we, we needed to, to be sure that, that people were happy with what we were doing and we have to do it in a controlled environment um, with, with obviously devices. We're not installing this on people's phones. Um, Although actually you don't need to install anything on people's phones if, if you have the right setup. So um, I think obviously it's something to be aware of, but obviously our interest is, is in the defense against this. Okay, Jonathan, thank you very much again. Congratulations for the work. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.